Hello. In episode 14 of season 3 of Airs for Architecture, I spoke with Rowan Moore, critic and writer, about his new book, Property, The Myth That Built the World, published by Faber and Faber this year. Airs for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to Airs for Architecture. I'm talking today to Rowan Moore about Rowan's very recent book, Property, The Myth That Built the World, published by Faber and Faber. Rowan, that's not much of an introduction for you. Would you be so gentlemanly as to introduce yourself? Okay. Um, my day job is I'm the architecture critic of The Observer, uh, which I've been doing for some time. I've also been editor of Blueprint, director of the Architecture Foundation in the past. Um, and as you say, I've just brought out this book, Property, The Myth That Built the World. Um, which is sort of grows out of the experience of living my entire adult life in what Margaret Thatcher called the property owning democracy and seeing what has worked and personally benefiting in some ways, but also seeing what is very much not working and, and you know, getting worse day by day. Yes. Could you talk about that a little bit? I mean, I suppose... It's in the media a lot, obviously, the housing crisis. What does that... And, and you spent the first half of the book more or less talking about various, in various ways, that the, the nature of that problem mm. uh, before before discussing in the second half of it historic and present solutions and, and then yeah. where you see it might go. But I was wondering if we could perhaps talk about that problem a little bit further. Um, you say right at the very end of the book, to a very nice sentence, if property is not natural, a convenient fiction and a useful instrument, its ongoing existence has to be justified by its continued usefulness and convenience. There's yeah. a lot in that. Yeah. Um, can we start with this idea of property not being natural? Yes. Well, so it was a, the book, as I say, was prompted by the kind of recent British experience, but it's not just about that so I do a bit of a world tour and I, I go into the past and the main line of inquiry is how does this thing which is private ownership um, which is meant to make you happy and rich and free and also make societies happy and rich and free and sometimes it does what happens when it goes wrong and what is the basis for that and what is the basis for what else you might have. Um, the reason it's called the myth that built the world, the myth in that is the idea that property is, is natural, which goes back to 17th century England, to John Locke and some other people. Um, and they had this idea that owning property, owning land was natural. It was like a kind of extension of your body that to take... Um, a piece of property away from someone was like cutting off a limb. And that was a very, very powerful and influential idea, which still kind of lingers in the background with the sort of sacrosanct status that is given to private property. Um, so the myth is that it's natural and, and um, it clearly isn't. It's clearly a, a kind of contrivance. Um, things like territory and shelter are natural. Those are things animals understand. But the idea of drawing lines in the ground and saying this belongs to this person um, and not this person is, is clearly a kind of artifice. So therefore, um, it's a means to an end. It's a way of achieving certain, hopefully, good things. But therefore, it needs to be judged by how well it achieves those good things, not treated as something that is self-evidently right and kind of God-given mm. all by itself. And so this fiction that we that you talk about, so this myth is a fiction that is, as you say, convenient. Yeah. Serves both, well, it it doesn't serve that effectively the commons or the, or, or the common good, but it does yeah. serve somebody's good. Who's it convenient for? Uh, well, it's good for people who own, basically. Um, Unless they go into negative equity, in which case, yeah. well, 
Yes, you can't go into negative equity unless you have a mortgage. So, um, and so that's that's an important point that you know lots of people who kind of quote unquote own have mortgages, which means that to some degree the bank owns their owns their home. Um, so yes, it's a myth that especially serves people who own which does not just mean sort of evil um, giant property companies, you know, it does also mean individuals who may not be all that well off. Um, you know, I certainly don't want to kind of attack the idea that that owning things at a small scale is a bad thing. Um, sorry, attack the idea that it's a good thing. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it benefits... People who own, but it doesn't benefit all people that own because, in fact, uh, you know, sometimes it can be a bit of a nightmare mm. for owners um, who, who might find themselves stuck mm. with with a place they don't want to be in or in a relationship they don't want to be in um, because they're locked into a mortgage and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, it, but it also sort of, and I think your book touches on this quite a lot, as I say, the first sort of third, first half, is that it's a superstructural convenience as well. I mean, it's political. Yes. And you, you, you say this, I think, very important point. Um, uh, again, um, about three quarters of the way through the book, you say house price inflation blights lives and leads to inequality. Now, we all know this. Yeah, yeah. And yet it's maintained. And I always sort of wonder whether if something is politically maintained when it need not be the case, mm. it must be intentional. So uh, convenient yeah. for other people? I think it is. Um, yes, yeah, so I talk about the property owning democracy as as sort of um, built up by Margaret Thatcher, um, which includes the basically positive idea that mm -hmm. it's a good thing if more people would own. Um, but that came coupled to house price inflation which is not a necessary part of it, but it it became an intrinsic part of it. Um, so starting in the 1980s and most of the time ever since, we have had house price inflation well above um, the rate of inflation and everything else. Um, and whereas inflation was seen as a very bad thing, both by Thatcher's government and subsequent governments in relation to everything else, it was not seen as a bad thing in relation to property, in relation to, to house prices, with the result that we, we have a kind of society divided into haves and have nots, the you know, the lucky people who bought early enough or whatever, you know, are sitting very pretty and then other people can't get close to a decent home. Um your question, who does it suit? Um well, it does suit people who own, and the majority of households in Britain are owner-occupied. So that's a pretty strong force for keeping prices going up, or certainly stopping them falling, because anyone who owns a house or a flat, you know, is, is going to feel better if the price goes up and, and kind of worried if they go down. Um, it benefits governments because successive governments have, have worked out that um, if you have rising house prices, people are more inclined to spend money, which they might do on credit. Um, but it helps to keep the economy ticking over, which creates tax revenues. Um, and it benefits the people who own land on which houses might be built and the house builders and so on and all that very big economy that is based on on buying land and making a profit out of it so that that's so lots and lots of agents and lots of like sort of independent actors but there is a kind of ideological position here isn't there which is as you, you've mentioned Thatcher there's this idea of the property and owning democracy which is a which is a which has not been challenged 
since Thatcher or the Thatcherite period proposed it. It's not been challenged by anybody. I mean, Starmer isn't challenging it. Um, Tony Blair didn't challenge it. If anything, accelerated it. Yeah. Um, so there is a kind of more profound or ontological condition at play here, which I'm quite interested in. And I was wondering whether there was some sense of when this inflection point happened, because it must, as a as we moved out of that post-war period of much more egalitarian ideas around state intervention in housing production, and you, you recount how both sides at that period were, both sides of the political divide, the Conservatives and the Labour Party were both on side competing to build houses, and you talk about that in the section on council housing. Mm -hmm. There comes a point where it shifts. What caused it? When is this shift? Is this early 90s? Is this... No, I'm really asking... Go on. Before that, I would say, well... Um, yeah, so, so as you say, 1945, Labour government comes in, makes <laughs> council house building and building new towns a very big part of their programme. The Conservatives feel obliged to compete with them on, on those issues. So the Conservatives win the 1951 election with a promise to build even more council housing than Labour, which they do, by the way, by making council houses kind of smaller and cheaper to build. Um, anyway, that's the consensus really until the 1970s. And you know, Margaret Thatcher becomes leader of the Conservative Party in 1975, I think. Um, and the first speech to conference she makes as Conservative leader, she talks about the property and democracy. And I think what's happening around that time is you have sort of a collapse of the post-war consensus in general about you know having a big welfare state, having lots of things nationalised, having a very kind of interventionist state. Um, partly because it stops working so well, that has to be said. You know, it was the seventies were not a great time, and part of the reason for that was things going wrong with that model. Um, and sort of as a corollary of that, you also get a loss of confidence in public housing, partly because some of that goes wrong, um, partly because people have an agenda to, to take it apart and, and dismantle it. Um, so... I would say, so it starts from kind of the mid seventies. Um, Margaret Thatcher makes it one of her big issues. She comes to power, she brings in the right to buy the council housing. That's a hugely successful policy politically mm -hmm. because it buys her votes basically. People who benefit from that are very happy with it and much more likely to vote conservative. Um, you know, if you've been given, if you've been sold a, a house at well below the market rate, which is what happened, um, you know, that, that's going to make you quite well disposed to the government that that does that. Um, and it was successful in the sense that you know, lots of people did it. It did dramatically change the numbers of people living in in council accommodation and the number of people owning their own homes, you know, which were its objectives. Uh, that went with a uh, deregulation of the mortgage markets. Um, so it became easier to get a mortgage, mm -hmm. whoever you're buying from, not, not just if you're a council house tenant, um, <clears throat> which also increased numbers of home ownership, but which very much helped to start this kind of inflation, cycle of inflation we've had mm -hmm. most of the time since then. By the way, if you're talking about um, who wins from property ownership, uh, another important factor in that is people who own their own homes are more likely to vote conservative, people who are council tenants are more likely to vote Labour. 
So therefore, conservative governments are very keen on increasing ownership. Um, and there was an occasion during the coalition government in the early 2010s when a Liberal Democrat, I think it was probably Nick Clegg, said to George Osborne, why don't we build more social housing? And George Osborne said, why would we want to do that? Because they're not going to vote for us. So, you know, that's another factor. Um, George Osborne, always saying the quiet bit out loud. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so in terms of how did the, the, the culture shift? Um, so as I say, you know, Margaret Thatcher made it a big issue. It was very successful in her terms. Um, Labour didn't feel they could confront it. Um, so they kind of went along with it and and, and sort of did their own version. Isn't it, uh, reading a, a recently a book by Jane Smiley, a, a novel by Jane Smiley called um, Good Faith. Yeah. Which she wrote in the early 90s about exactly this moment. Mm -hmm. About the emergence of the consumer society. Yeah. Which this... This problem that you've, this myth, I suppose, that you've, you, you talk about deals with. The idea that a home is a commodity like any other commodity, um, but in a way is better than most other commodities, except, I guess, oil paintings, Steinway pianos, and gold, in that yeah. it appreciates in value. You know, even a Rolls Royce doesn't, normal Rolls Royce won't appreciate that much in value. So, it has this remarkable kind of quality to it. This emergence of this thing that, because I, I I'm not sure I track the, the 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 chronology of Margaret Thatcher enabling council tenants to buy their homes, um, leading inevitably towards this property owning uh, this um, this consumer turn in housing um, provision and consumption. Uh, no, it doesn't have to lead to that. Um, it was how that happened was was not just selling council houses. Um, it was also, as I say, the sort of liberalisation of um, of lending, oh, yeah. mortgages, um, which all went along with the kind of the big bang and the. Um, the kind of celebration of the City of London, mm -hmm. the bigging up of Britain as a financial centre. Um, you know, speculation was a thing to be celebrated, mm -hmm. not only in property. Um, you know, people encouraged to buy shares in companies. Um, yeah, there was a real culture of, of just, just getting really excited about the possibility of making money from speculation. Um, and when that, when you're talking about houses and homes, yes, you get this phenomenon where because um, the value is going up so much, it does get treated more and more as an investment and people start basing their pensions on it. Um, people are encouraged to maximise their investment in homes. So if you can buy a home and the value is going up and the more you own, the more profit you make, the more the, you know, the, the, more, the greater the value of the increase. Um, the kind of economically rational thing to do is to put every single bit of money that you possibly can into your home. So you you get the biggest mortgage you can, you buy the biggest, most valuable home you can, you add to it, you extend it, you kind of invest in improving it and increasing its value. Um, 
and in that way, this kind of culture of the city of London, that as I say, was kind of celebrated, comes into your own personal life as an ordinary citizen. Mm. Um, so yes, that's sort of how it happened. Yeah, and you talk at the very end of the book in this rather, um, rather lovely mayor culpa in a way about your own home and how this problem persists because it, well, for all of the reasons that you've talked about, that kind of insinuation of that thinking about acquisition. And, you know, I'm a homeowner as well, and I'm amazed at how much money it absorbs. Um, appalled compared to... The, <laughs> talked to my wife this morning about how we saved up for a deposit. It was just like shoving it in a hole in the ground, like just disappeared. It vaporized. And, it, you know, the, the actual... Yeah, the house absorbs everything. But but I but I, I think so I think this is a really interesting idea that we we've got to this kind of point where it's almost impossible to escape the logic that underpins this myth. It's all encompassing, even if you don't want to be a part of it. And again, my wife and I have talked a lot about co-op housing and cooperative, you know, co-living, co-housing of various kinds and how we would love to do it, but yeah. But you know, what about the house value? What about the kids? What about, you know, our pension? All of these things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as you say, I end up the book, you know, because I'm I'm one of the lucky ones, mm. mostly because I'm quite old. So I bought a house more than 30 years ago. That is worth, I don't know, 15 times what I paid for it or something like that. Um so, you know, I, I felt the need to check my privilege. Um, but I feel, you know, I, I can't honestly say I would have done anything different. No. Because I don't, you know, it wouldn't have kind of really helped anyone if I had done it differently. But I would like to live in a country where... Um, you know, my house and everyone else's was worth a whole lot less. Mm. Um, you know, if that meant that people could get on the property ladder more easily or rent more easily um, or not spend 60% of their income on housing. Mm. So, yes, I mean, it's, it's been the only desirable model for having a home for a really long time mm. in, in Britain. And, you know, that just should not be the case. Mm. Um, private renting, there should be good ways of doing private renting. There should be good ways of uh, renting from the from the state. <clears throat> but they're seen as very inferior forms of tenure. And quite, <coughs> quite a lot of the time, you know, they are inferior, you know, they definitely are a lousy deal. So, um, it would be nice if a home could be like a loaf of bread, only obviously bigger and more expensive, but you know, you just buy what you need and mm. for a reasonable price and you sell it. I don't you sell it for a reasonable price and, and I don't see why that fundamentally can't be the case. Uh it's just it's very hard to know how we get to that situation mm. from where we are now, because we're so kind of hooked on it. I was thinking the the the, the thing that you you mentioned Hernando de Soto uh, towards the beginning of the book when you're when you're yeah. discussing this mm -hmm. uh, idea and his work around informality and the idea of slum upgrading which he did or informal settlement upgrading yeah. that he talked about mm -hmm. this issue around tenure I, I, I was thinking about why this has become dominant and um, reflecting on your book why this has been successful in ways that other forms of tenure have not been successful. Because, I mean, the thing with the selling of the council homes, for example, is that so many people went for it. She yeah. tapped into, the, the Thatcher government tapped into something that was absolutely primed and ready to happen. For whatever reason, whether it was media coverage, whether it was the failures of things like Ronan Point and um, various um, uh, uh, blighted um, and, and ignored housing estates on, in peripheries, whatever the reason. And I was wondering whether that 
De Soto idea, which is articulated by other scholars, including people like Ostrom later on, who you mentioned, um, mm -hmm. is, a, is around the idea of tenure and ownership. Mm -hmm. that, that what housing, that property, sorry to use the word you use, what property does is it gives us a feeling of sovereignty in our own lives. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty is obviously a bit of a red flag word at the moment. But, yeah. but this idea of autonomy, I suppose, an, another way of, of, of putting it. Um, well, gosh, there's a lot there. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, number one, you know, as, as, as I keep saying, I'm not against private ownership. And there is no doubt that probably most people would want to own if they could. Um, it's partly an emotional thing. It does sort of put you in charge of your own destiny. Um, it's kind of efficient in some ways in that, or in principle it is, in that you know, very often the person who knows best what should happen to their home is the person who lives in it. Mm. Um, so, you know, if you want to kind of repaint the front door or fix a leaky gutter, um, it's it's going to happen more effectively if the owner just does it than if they have to make an application to the council to send around a maintenance team. Um, and so you mentioned De Soto, who you had this big idea that you should give title to people who lived in informal settlements, in um, especially in Latin America. And he said you can unlock a huge amount of wealth by doing that. And that if people have title, they can then do things like use it as security if they want to set up a business. Um, they can raise a loan against it, and that's all just great for the economy and sort of socially great. Uh, and his ideas were put into practice to some degree, and they did work in some instances. In others, they didn't, um, because what happened is, so you have basically people owning a very small amount of property, people who are poor, they have title in a, in a very low value piece of land um the sort of thing can happen is that someone comes along and buys that land from them and accumulates it and then has the leverage to basically evict them or do what they like so that's the kind of dark side of that um then as you say thatcher people most people were very happy to buy uh, council homes partly because they were subsidised, which, which obviously made it considerably more attractive. But you know, definitely people like that. Um, so, yes, it's a powerful and attractive idea. It's just not the only show in town. And if you come to the philosophy of it, and, and your mention of sovereignty is interesting in that respect, um, you know, there's an argument about whether property is ever truly private. Mm. So De Soto has this sort of hyper-individualistic philosophy. He says, you know, everything in the world, everything in nature has a boundary around it, like cells and the body. Um, the human body itself has, a, has an epidermis. Um, you know, he says the world is made up of self-contained discrete elements with clear boundaries and property is therefore like that and everything should be like that um i find that a weird philosophy because um it's just not true if you're talking about nature i mean nature is made of waves as well as particles um in computer you know you have networks you have so many examples of things that are not self-contained units <clears throat> in the wider world. So I find that just a sort of very strange description of, of nature and society. Um, and the counter argument to that was that put forward by Henry George, for example, American economist in the 19th century, who was 
hugely influential once upon a time. And he argued that the wealth in property is, is primarily social. In other words, you might own a piece of land, but the value of it comes to a great extent from what other people do. So if someone builds a road or a railway or other kinds of infrastructure, or if you live in a city and your neighbours also live in the city and people open shops and people go to the shops and all of that creates the value of your home. So in other words, um, the, you know, the value of property is, a, is created by a community, not just by individuals, which gives uh, the community some rights and even duties to use that wealth in a communal way. So George himself proposed a land value tax, um, which is a tax on the sort of surplus value of of property over and above what its kind of intrinsic value might be considered to be. Um, he thought that would be such an effective form of taxation that you wouldn't need any others whatsoever. So all tax would be land value tax. <clears throat> That has never really caught on in practice. Um, the main difficulty being, you know, how do you how do you define which bit of the value of a place is private and which bit is is sort of created by the community, and that's that's a very hard thing to do. But his ideas have been influential, partly through the medium of Ebenezer Howard and the Garden City. Um, and if you read Ebenezer Howard's book, an awful lot of it is about the financing of garden cities. The bit that everyone remembers is not about the financing, it's about the idea of having houses and countryside and leafy roads all kind of mixed up. Um, but Howard said that the what do you call the unearned increment, which is the sort of uplift in value in land that comes with community investment, should be spent on communal benefits. So, um, you know, he said if you if you, you designate a garden city, you invest in roads, infrastructure, schools, etc., the value of the land goes up. That increase in value should remain shared property to be spent on further public benefits, which was then the model that was applied to the post-war Newtown program, um, where, where the government compulsorily purchased land, invested in it, gave itself planning permission to build homes, etc. The value went up. Um, but because it belonged to the public through development corporations, um, that wealth kind of got recycled for the public benefit. <clears throat> As a result of which, and this is not, you know, the exact numbers are disputed, but it said that the whole Newtown programme ended up costing the British Treasury nothing because it ended up paying for itself. As I say, that may not be exactly true, but it was certainly a very good deal for the mm -hmm. for the public sector. It's, it's interesting that the the Milton Keynes is a really interesting example, and you use yeah. this when you talk about the some of the yeah you know, as you as you've already talked about uh, here um, some of the the solutions that are proposed, not least through Howard's kind of Garden City. And I'm interested in this idea that he focuses so much on on financing, which is obviously. Um, which is obvious when you think about it. Um, and Howard is a very kind of, you know, his whole thing, and, and many, many um, uh, thinkers and, and, and activists of that time are contesting kind of the problematic of modernity. Yeah. Um, and they're proposing essentially a, 
Okay, I suppose a, a repositioned modernity or perhaps post post modernity. I don't know what it is, but mm -hmm. it seems to me that <clears throat> if if theorists are right that you know modernity has in part been a process of alienation, then the rise of property is the kind of culmination, the fulfillment of that promise, that that objective of being modern, to be separate, to be individuated. Um, this kind of humanistic project of drawing red lines around everything has has done that to biology, it's done that to uh, community, it's done that to all sorts of things in very brilliant and very problematic ways at the same time. I wonder whether the, the, what you're just a kind of I suppose, finish talking about the problem whilst crossing over to talking about the solutions that you outline. I wonder if there's any sense that what you are essentially arguing for is sort of almost like a new psychology of citizenship, of a new way of thinking and being a citizen in contemporary Britain or in the modern world. Um, yeah, you say it's kind of modernity, um, this, this, this culture of individualism and... It is, but I don't think it's it's the whole of modernity. So I don't think it's a sort of necessary way of being modern. Um, and I guess I am arguing for a different kind of idea of of citizenship. I wouldn't say it's new exactly, but um, it's certainly one that needs a bit of um, encouragement at the moment. Um, but. Yes, you know, I would say that it's a very odd idea to think that everyone exists completely on their own. I would say the opposite is true. You don't really become yourself except through interaction with other people. Your your personality, yourself, does not really does not exist entirely inside you. It only exists through you being part of the world. Um, yeah, and this also relates, again, you mentioned sovereignty. So the idea of sovereignty that gave us Brexit is a manifestation of that extreme individualism. This is, so, the, so you have the idea that, that an individual is a kind of completely defined, bounded entity. And then the same idea applies to an entire country. So that idea of sovereignty says that a country like Britain um, has to have a very clear boundary about it and cannot sort of share anything with anyone else for fear of losing its sovereignty, for fear of losing sort of what it is. Um, and I think that's a very, very damaging and destructive idea. Um, so... Yeah, my my book is, if you like, kind of a, a modest challenge to that that way of thinking. Yeah, you talked about you talked about science. You sort of just say you, you know you mentioned science. You know, the way in which science has, has done well by also breaking things down into kind of defined entities. But again, that's not the whole of science, and um, you know, for quite a long time, science has recognised the importance of waves and things that are not particles. Um, and as I said before, we had networking in computers, um, which which also kind of goes against this idea of everything having boundaries. Mm. Yeah. You, the, the, the three solutions that I picked up on that you were talking about, mm. New Towns, which you've you already mentioned, Milton Keynes, an extraordinary story of a unbelievable expansion of a place over the last um, 50 odd years. And mm. um, you also talk about co-ops and you talk about this wonderful co-op in um, New York. Yeah. Um, co-op city. Yeah. Which is, was completely new to me, which I feel slightly ashamed of as given that it claims to be the largest co-op in the world. It was new to me, I think, when I started writing the book, but yes. Um, how do these? I, I, but these, and you describe these, uh, uh, these, and council homes you talk about as well. These three particular things in, in a very even-handed way. You 
describe both the positives and the negatives um, as they might be seen. But there's a kernel within each of them that is something that you then draw out into this idea where you start touching upon uh, um, Erna Ostrom's ideas around the commons and, and how that might um, materialize in yeah. a new way of doing property. Um, I was wondering what, what was the kind of key was there a kind of a singular idea that underpinned those different examples that you give, or is there a kind of is it a panoply, like a, a, a range of things? That... Um, okay, well, there's no one big theory. Um, I don't think you can have a big theory of property. So one of the points I make in the book is that property is different everywhere which has to do with geographic economic social uh cultural factors you know so property is even different as between england and scotland it's different again from france mm -hmm. um it's nomadic people whether they're in the arctic or in australia have a completely different attitude to land which arises from being nomadic, um, that means it works for them, but you probably can't kind of import it to Britain and expect it to work. Um, so the, yeah, there's no one big answer, but I, in the book, I, I try and sort of address the balance, redress the balance, um, by looking at models that are based on this idea that wealth and property is is shared, um, and it's not purely private, and that includes cooperatives, um, community land trusts. The example in uh, of Co-op City in the Bronx in New York. Um, was kind of a culmination of a cooperative housing movement that started earlier in the 20th century uh, that really came from labour unions who were inspired by European models. Um, and Co-op City was the, was the biggest and really the last of those. <laughs> Arguably too big, um, but it means that people who, in Co-op City, people own their homes but um they don't effectively own but the sort of freeholding effect is shared um and that means the the sort of common parts of the complex are common property um and also when people sell they sell for the amount they paid for it plus inflation just a regular you know, retail inflation, they do not sell it at the price that the kind of speculative property markets mm -hmm. um, dictate. And, you know, among the effects of that, you know, well, it makes housing accessible for people on sort of low to middle incomes. Um, so you, you get a mix, you know, it's not, it's not housing just for the very poorest people. Um, nobody's rich, but yeah, you, you have a kind of range of, of people of different kind of backgrounds and income levels. Um, it means that the shared parts are well looked after. Um, <coughs> so Corp City actually looks like the sort of Corbusian, the classic Corbusian city, probably more than almost any place in the world. So it has point blocks with parks around it and roads. You know, the model that that has been very thoroughly sort of um, criticised and discarded around the world, you know, what the sort of, you know, the all kind of, all, all the sort of orthodox thinking is you don't build places like that. Um, but in this situation, it works. And it works because people have a genuine sense of ownership 
over the shared parts of the complex. Mm. So you know, the classic failed Corbusier housing estate, you have kind of playgrounds with broken swings and kind of no man's land with graffiti and people smashing things up and <clears throat> ripping up trees and whatever. That doesn't happen in Co-op City because everyone feels they own it. Um, so there's that. Uh, I, there's Milton Keynes, um, which is an astonishing achievement because it is a city built from nothing, almost nothing. Yeah, I know. I was going to say the 167 people that lived there just before it started probably didn't think it was nothing. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, indeed. And, you know, there are sort of little villagey bits still there from, from before they built the city. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but this is a great... You know, building a city from scratch is meant to be basically an impossible task. But they did do it in Milton mm-hmm. Keynes. And it gets very high, you know, when they do kind of quality of life surveys and they ask people, what do you think about living in Milton Keynes compared to other cities? It always scores really highly. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a pretty good model. Um, something, I guess I sort of, learned through doing the book, which I wasn't especially expecting to learn, was that examples so co- of cooperative communal housing that are purely self-sustaining are quite hard to find at a large scale, to find them working successfully at a large scale. Uh, so... I would love to have been able to report that you can you can achieve you know you can change society with large scale cooperative housing and I can't honestly say that mm. <laughs> the examples I found that were successful did come with a fairly significant amount of state support um, so I come down more in favour of publicly assisted housing than I necessarily expected. And I think the reason for that is you just have to, the private sector, the sort of, the the business of house building and property speculation is so powerful that you need a kind of powerful countervailing force Mm. against it, which is not really going to happen from at a large scale, it's not going to happen from bottom-up initiatives um, because, you know, people who buy, if you want to set up a co-op or a community land trust, you are competing in the market for land with the big house buyers, house builders, (laughs) and they are, you know, they're pretty good at buying land. Uh, it's probably their number one skill. And, yeah, so it's, it's tough to compete, mm. basically. Um, but I was I was wondering, there's, there's the three examples that I, I talked about, the co-ops, the new towns and, and the council housing, mm. they're, they're produced, as you say, but to, by, by this very interesting, to go back to Austin, this very interesting co-productive relationship yeah. between a number of parts So going back, I suppose, the beginning of our conversation to to think about the idea of who makes what and and where boundaries exist in in the world of Mm housemaking. It's not just that houses are are, are, are not truly discrete entities like like they've been proposed, but also the processes of their production are quite open-ended. And the most effective examples like council housing that you've talked about on this COP are produced by a vast array. They're in a sort of on an ongoing achievement. They're not a, a fixed thing. And, and you, you know, when talking about the, the Bronx Cop, you, the, the idea of the, the the citizen or resident organisations that manage it is is a, is a kind of manifestation, another part of this architecture. But but the architectures that you describe are all kind of, in a way, defined. Like physical nature of the architecture is defined by that complex co-productive set of relationships like the architecture that it produces 
who has a certain series of typologies mm. and forms. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Um... Just as we would say, you know, like private domestic um, volume house builders produce architecture of a certain kind because of their procurement processes mm -hmm. and because they want to flog things super cheap. So they make cheap looking buildings that have kind of popular motifs and so mm -hmm. sorts. Um, yeah, and that's true up to a point. I mean, I'm thinking of things like... Um, Some of the things that were done in the seventies, like Bonington Square in Vauxhall, <laughs> which was some Victorian houses were um, sort of condemned by the local authority and going to be knocked down, and local residents campaigned against that, and they ended up buying them in some sort of cooperative way, and I can't I'm afraid remember the details of that. Um, but it's still there. And if you go there, it looks like your typical Victorian terraces and squares that were originally privately built by developers and are now mostly privately owned. <laughs> but the important difference is what the shared spaces feel like. And they, and again, those are a collective responsibility. So they're, they're more looked after, but they're also more informal and casual. So people put planters on the pavement outside their houses on, you know, what would normally be seen as the territory of the local authority. And therefore, <clears throat> not a place where you feel comfortable putting out a flower pot. Um, either because someone from the council will come and tell you to take it away or because someone will damage it or steal it. But because there's kind of spirit of collaboration and sharing in this particular enclave, that doesn't happen. Um, so in a way, what's different is not so much the look, but... <clears throat> how things are used and experienced and how the, the shared space is used and experienced. Um, so again, as I, as I was saying about Co-op City, it looks like your typical Corbusian estate, which most of the time would be built by a local authority. <laughs> um, but the way it is used and experienced is, is very significantly Different. That mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and that's not and that's not to do with the formal organization, aesthetic organizations, the buildings themselves, but much yeah. more to do with the social process that is facilitated or enabled within it. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. But does architecture? I mean, so we've been through a period in the last thirty years, I suppose, perhaps more, um, of architecture being this game which is about shape making and. Mm -hmm. fun i suppose to a certain extent it doesn't seem to have much of a place in um well i mean architects haven't had much of a role in in volume reducing volume housing for a very long time not not in a significant way although perhaps that's changing but does that you know as speaking as the, uh, uh, as someone who has an intimate knowledge of contemporary architecture as you do mm. do you see that this is something that the profession of architecture might have some role to play in, or is this to do with economics, politics? Um, I think, yes, I think architects have, have a role to play, um, but not really in sort of shape making exactly. Um, it's, I think planning and infrastructure and things like that are much more important. So if you're talking about, um, let's say, new towns, you know, Keir Starmer has sort of said a few things about new towns, and there is this idea <coughs> that we could build some um, 
And if you want to go back to sort of learning from the models of the post-war Newtown movement and also learning from the mistakes, um, there's a big question about how land is used and planned, and that's partly an architectural question. Um, so if you take you know, an empty site <clears throat> and you want to build some houses on it, plus schools and shops and whatever else, um, you know, that's, that's a design decision, or it should be a design decision. Um, you know, how do you arrange those places in relation to each other? How do you arrange the roads, the parks that go between them? Uh, that's absolutely a, a matter of design. Um, and it's, but it's more design at the level of planning than anything else. Uh, so architects should find ways to make themselves useful in that respect. If you know, obviously they have to fight pretty hard to be heard. Um, there's this place called Holton outside Rugby that I've written about in The Observer, which is pretty good from that point of view, the way it's designed so that you can people can walk their kids to school through what are basically kind of linear parks. Um, the design of the individual houses in Holton are nothing special. They're your kind of standard developers fair. Um, yeah, so the number one role of architects could and should be how you use land well, um, you know, how, you, how you achieve higher densities, etc. And then the design of the individual home, I would say, is less important. But, yeah, if architects can show ways of building individual homes that are better than the house builder's standard fare, I'd be all for that. But what it's really not about is, is style. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's good things about Poundbury. The, the architectural style of it makes my flesh creep. I would hate to live there, but that's my own personal feeling. And there's plenty of people who don't feel that. So I have no desire to sort of dictate, um, you know, to tell people they have to live in a kind of tasteful modern house if they don't want to. I, I think architects have to really think about what they can offer in terms of really tangible good things that people who are not architects would appreciate. And that's quite hard, but you know that that's the important thing. So I don't think it's, it's any good saying to people, you have to live in a modern house because that's sort of aesthetically better in some way. Um, but you can say you might want to live in a modern house because you get more daylight and better details and more intelligent planning um, and better use of space and things like that. So I think architects have to justify themselves in terms of concrete benefits that anyone can see. Uh, not not a sort of um, not a, some kind of stylistic argument. Fantastic! That's a wonderful point to finish on. Thank you very much, Rod. Okay, thank you. I enjoyed it. An empty stomach knows no morality, as Proudhon said, nor does an empty head. Thanks to Rowan for filling mine up a bit and for his time and engagement. Thanks to Faber and Faber for the book. Links to it and to Rowan's professional and social online presences are in the podcast description as normal. Thanks for listening. <laughs>